uh, we're going to get started uh, with our afternoon set of seminars. And the best way to introduce Carl is to ask, who here does not know who Carl Strenick is? Raise your hand. And you know, one, one of the most interesting things I saw in his uh, resume, let's put it this way, is that he won 17 and a half national champions wow. championships. Wow. I don't know where the half comes from. How do you win a national championship a half of the way? You have a seeing eye lieutenant in the back seat. Sarah, ah. Sarah Arnold in the duo. I see. Well, anyway, we are very lucky to have Carl here. He's going to tell us about bridge soaring. And let's get started. Thank you, Daniel. Um, we're lucky to have guys like him and gals and so forth that uh, keep this sport going. You know, just going out there and flying at the airport is one thing, but keeping it going through the winters and, and the, the engines that uh, you know, the movers and shakers really make a difference, and I really appreciate them. And the Aero Club Abatross does have a, some place in my foundation of soaring, too. It was the very first contest I flew in was here at uh, Blairstown in 1970, and I went back and looked at my log book, and uh, I think Carl Kretschmer set it up, and uh, I think Colbert and Byers were, were running the thing, and I, I, the log book has two tasks, so I don't know if it was just a weekend contest or what it was, but the first task was to go from here to BGC and back, you know, that far, I don't know what that is, but five inches or something down there to PGC, but it took me six hours. <laughs> <laughs> and the second day was from, uh, was actually the last, the second and last day was free distance, so it just goes as far as you could. So I just flew home. <laughs> 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 but it took me seven hours to get less than 140 miles, well that's less than 20 miles an hour, right? so things have changed. But um, anyway, um, I've got this more or less set up in, in terms of uh, three different um, sections here. We'll talk about the weather, glider performance, and then technique of flying the reefs. If you've got any questions, uh, I'll skip over stuff or say stuff wrong. You know, please uh, chime in and, and tell me what I'm, I'm screwing up here. Um, first of all, this is the, the weather. I used to watch Unisys all the time. You know, in the old days, you had what? You had two things. You had a radio and you had flight service station. That was it. And then the internet came along. Now everybody in the room probably has a different weather system they look at. But uh, I was uni uni using Unisys until about three weeks ago, and they evaporated, so they're not there anymore. <laughs> so I, I switched over to the National Weather Service. This, this is all the stuff you really need here. Um, this is the main page of it. And then um, if you, uh, well, so I'll go back there. If you go right over to, to this, if you go to this, if you uh, click that, you get this, and that's the various um, maps for the next three days, then, you know, uh, all the way up, and then this this here is a loop, so this, these, all these highs and lows will go across this loop for the next three days, so that's going to tell you where the highs and lows are going to be in the, the precip and uh, how the alignment of the isobars are. Um, and then you have terminal area forecast, I'm sure you all know about that, you call flight service station or go on the, you don't have to call them up, you, you go on the internet and, and get uh, put in the, uh, the station you want. This is a University Park, or you can put an Al uh, Allentown Bethlehem down here for your closest weather, and it'll give you the uh, the, the winds and um, uh, what the weather's going to be. Here's a sample of the of a uh, TAP thermal area forecast. Um, this is the present conditions. And this is what they forecast it to be. Um, remember that these winds they give you those are magnetic. Everything else is true. Everything from above the ground is true true winds. So. You have to uh, think about uh, um, variation. Uh, you have to fly, I think, around here it's 11 degrees. <clears throat> One I like is because it's more like a comic book. It was about my level of uh, intellectual reading. So it, it's, got, it's got stuff you can see. You don't have to read anything. But this is the U.S. Air Net. I don't know if any of you guys use this or not. I really like it. It has uh, th three days ahead here, and uh, it gives you the uh, wind velocity along here, um, and then uh, what the clouds are going to do. A temperature dew points down here at the bottom. If it's if it's fairly small dew point, you know you might have to worry about rain showers, snow showers, or low ceilings or overcast or something like that. Um, so that's th those are some weather systems you can use. Um, okay, next is uh, wind. Obviously, if we're going to talk about ridge lift, wind's really important, and uh, the um, there's different ways you can get the direction. Now I got to make sure that. 
Uh, I've been uh, accused of using ancient and outdated charts in my <laughs> Cleveland sectionals, and uh, so I want to happen to have in my drawer that I made this presentation for is uh, cost 25 cents, so you can tell it's a little bit old. <laughs> <laughs> but it is restricted, so anybody that doesn't have a clearance, I have to get up and leave now. <laughs> anyway, if, you're, if you, you have to know the direction of your ridge. So this is uh, around here in the, in the Blairstown Ridge, as you guys would probably know, it's about 240 true, which makes a, uh, a right angle of uh, 330. So if the, the winds are, the true winds are going to be 330 for a, a perfect angle, and, uh, and then at some other parts of the ridge, uh, say you go down over to Mifflin, you go, you're going to go down to uh, Roanoke or, or Cumberland, then you got to worry about a, uh, a wind of 290 is true there. So it depends where you're going to be flying. <clears throat> Another indication when you're in the air, you got these hovering red-tailed hawks. They're a perfect wind indicator when they're hovering. If they're not flying along, they're down there looking for a mouse or something, and they're pointing exactly into the wind, so you can use that. If you're flying near Tyrone or you fly down the ridge towards uh, Covington, um, Virginia, there's 52 windmills down there on top of that ridge each year. About five years ago, there were no windmills. Now there's 52 of them, and they, they're pretty intimidating when you're, when you're right down next to them. <laughs> As you guys that know what fly, fly these airplanes with bendy wings, you can tell that, that windmill's doing some work. Um, okay, um, let's see. The, uh, the perfect angle is, uh, as, as you know, is a right angle, but the ridge is turned. So, um, oops, darn it. Um, the, in, in, if you're flying out of Mifflin or the, the glider port, ridge soaring glider port's up here off the, the screen, but um, it would be uh, something like this. If you're flying at Blairstown, then you've got a little bit more oblique. If you were going to fly from, say, Mifflin down to uh, uh, <coughs> Potomac and back, this would be an ideal wind. And say it was, you know, you had 20 knot wind, uh, you might be doing you know, in a fiberglass glider, you might be doing 120 knots. If you're, if you're on shorts, it's doing, you're still flying 120. <laughs> <laughs> you're standing on your feet. And uh, so, but then as you would progress up to the northeast, um, the wind becomes more and more of a tailwind component, but you don't really feel it. You don't notice it, and you look at your ground speed, and boy, it's going faster and faster. You think, boy, this is really great, but the day's getting stronger. That, that's, that's the feeling you have until you turn around and go the other way. <laughs> <laughs> then the ground speed goes away, and also the problem with going back the other way is uh, anytime you fly through the sink, you're in a lot longer, and if you've got any little wiggle on the ridge or something wrong, Going back in wind is a lot harder than going downwind through that same area. So be aware of that. Okay. There's a kind of a classic high-low situation, not for flying the ridge here, but that's what you want to look for if uh, this low the next day would be up here and the high would be down here somewhere. Ideally, if you want to make a long flight, um, you want the, the high to be way down here in uh, Arkansas or Oklahoma and the low to be off Long Island or up in Maine or something, but just as long as the, 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 the highs to the southwest have been the lows of the northeast are better off. It seems like, in, in, I don't know if it's just complaining or I'm getting old or whatever, it seems like there's fewer ridges than there were 30 years ago to me uh, in the spring. And the reason I, I've been watching these lows, and they, instead of coming right up across Ohio and off of Long Island, they seem to be going more over Chicago and up or, over Toronto now. And that makes when the finally they get through, get more of a, uh, a lesser velocity and more out of the west. Okay. Um, yeah. I just put this in here because the, the, you need really if, if it's not forecast to be more than about 12 knots, you're kind of wasting your time up there. I mean, you can stay up, but you're probably not going to go anywhere because there's going to be places where. The ridge is not as good. The 12 knots won't work. Um, if the ridge is real steep, like this is down between, uh, this is down near Seneca Rocks, and it's up about 4,000 feet, so it's actually above 4,000 feet, that terrain is. So the winds are going to be stronger, higher you go, and it's a vertical cliff there, so obviously you're going to go ripping along there without any problems. But there's places, uh, if you fly enough ridge, where you have all sorts of things, like rounded off ridges that look more like a football, those won't be as strong. <coughs> Um, speaking about strength, um, the, uh, it can be too strong. I've had days when I took off, and
and uh, it was just too damn strong, too rough, and you're taking chances with turbulence and not necessarily structural problems with the glider, but I just went back and I couldn't get into my place because it's on top of the ridge, so I just went down to the glider port and landed. It was a little safer to land down there. But it's, it's you know, like anything else, it's, you can get seriously killed in this sport, so if, you, if you're not sure, just don't go, okay? And this can happen if you do go and take a chance. Um, that happened down, uh, that was Dale Kramer that augured in down uh, towards, um, towards Cummington, and uh, luckily, the guy that's in this room saved his life because Dale crashed, but he was, he was in pretty good shape. I mean, he had a busted leg, and that was all out of this. But he's laying there overnight up at, at 4,000 feet. The, the, the blizzard's blowing, it's below, freezing, it's snowing. And luckily, he got, he had, this is another thing, make sure you take a cell phone with you if you're going to do this kind of stuff. And he had a cell phone. He got one call out to John Good, um, who luckily was walking into to the ramp because he had aborted the flight. So he... Got his the phone rang, he got it up, and Dale said just in a few words where, and John knew immediately where it was. He's just north of, of Snowy Mountain. So John then took over and saved his life because if they left it up to CAP, they would have still not got to him. <laughs> anyway, so the, the point here is, yeah, you know, I don't think there's as much testosterone in this room so, as there was about 40 years ago. But <laughs> <laughs> you know your own level, so, so be careful, okay? Now, moisture is another situation um, besides the strength and the direction. Um, you can have too much moisture. That forces the ceiling down, and uh, then you can have showers, um, uh, rain showers, snow showers. Um, there's, they are, there's two uh, different situations with, uh, depending on what they are. A snow shower is a fairly reasonably safe thing. You can fly through it, uh, and it doesn't stick to the wings, and it doesn't cause any de degradation on the lift. And visually, it doesn't do anything to what you see. It, it, it just but it goes by the airplane, but rain on a different, uh, on the other hand, uh, I guess on your canopy, it gives you a false sense, especially when you're landing. Uh, uh, landing with rain, in the rain is really tricky in a glider, I think, because if it's streaming back over the canopy, you get a false sense of how fast you're going. And also, you can't see as far. So, depending on whether it's rain or snow, uh, and if you can see through, if, you, if there's a snow shower in front of you, you can see through it, it's safe to fly through it. Rain shower, be careful. That's a bald eagle, by the way. Um, okay, glider performance. Um, any questions so far? Yeah, Carl, just curious, yeah. on, a, on an optimum ridge like that, how high would you typically be above the ridge in a 12 knot wind? How high would it be in a 12 knots? In yeah, what glider? A 12 knot wind. What glider do you fly? Apis. A what? 40, uh, it's just a regular uh, 15 meter. 50 meters. Well, I mean, what I want to fly, or could I? Would the 12 knots support it? Yeah, 12 knots. Yeah. Not, yeah. What will it support you at? What height above the ridge? If you went to slow, you went best level over deep, probably up uh, 12 knots. Perfect. It depends what the ridge is around here at Blairstown. You'd probably be at 500 feet above the ridge if you want oh, really? to be that high. So if you, so you slow down, slow, you will get high then. If you what? If you slow down, you will get oh, high. Oh yeah. Yeah. Even in 12. Yeah. yeah. It's a trade-off. Speed. Sure. It's altitude. Yep. So, yeah. Okay. Um, if you're flying a, a the performance depends a lot on the course on the glider. If you're flying a, a late model 15 meter or, or 18 meter glider in 15 meter cons configuration, and you're all full of water, you probably got 11 pounds a square foot. So you're going to rip it along. If you're a Ron Schwartz, you're, you're probably doing 11 pounds a square foot. If you're Ron Schwartz, you're doing four pounds a square foot. So that's going to be a little bit different. So it depends what you're flying <laughs> and what you want to do. But this uh, uh, this is an ASW-17 with no, without the wing tips on it, which would be a good ridge machine because the wing load would be high and it'd be pretty much indestructible with turbulence. Um, water ballast it makes a big difference, of course. Uh, um, what your your wing loading is everything. So. Um, having water in the airplane is going to make you go a lot faster. Do not use a tail ballast. It doesn't help you at all. If, you, if the majority of your flying is going to be on the ridge going straight ahead, you want a more stable airplane anyway. So you got to get the CG forward. Then you can have less oscillation and pitch and yaw. It's easier flying. And also a tail ballast is more likely, if it's cold, it's more likely to freeze up than other water is. Uh, so um, I, I never use tail ballast. You can use alcohol. I have used that in the past. Uh, Freezing point of alcohol is 174 degrees below zero, so um, you don't need very much of it. Five or ten gallons is plenty, but uh, it's kind of a nuisance. 
So if it's if it's going to be really cold, either don't take it or plan the landing with it. Um, if um, uh, you do have if you go, if you have water ballast and you're flying when it's really cold, and you go to dump the ballast and the handle doesn't go anywhere, don't force it because you're going to break something. Maybe you might break, and also you might break one. Handle one might dump and one might not. Then what do you got? You got water in one wing. You can't get rid of it. So um, if, you, if you have a, a resistance that's abnormally high for dumping the water ballast, just leave it in there and land with it. What happened? No, it's going to come back. Sorry. Did I do it? Oh. Nope. I think it screws up an IT. I usually do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, water ballast. Um, and of course. Faster the dump, the better. There's not much you can do about it, most of it. I did, I had the first duo I got, duo discus, I had a, a time to dump. I wanted, you want to be able to dump fast on the ridge because you're what? You're 800 feet above a landing. And if you all of a sudden have to land, you got 800 feet. Well, that's, that can happen pretty quick. And, if, and the first duo I got took 13, 13 or 17 minutes to dump all the water out of this thing. Oh, got it. So I got bigger ports and put in there. But the main thing in a Shemp Hearth design is the air goes in to replace the water, comes in a little bitty hole on top of the wing. And, you know, it's a little pressure up there. don't want to go in anyway. So I took some brass tubing, drilled a hole in the bottom of the wing, and ran right up to the outboard end of the uh, water tank. And I had the, so the air for my duo came in from the bottom on a high pressure. It went in and, and changed the dump time from 17 minutes to two minutes to dump all the water. <laughs> You can tell it really fast too as you look out and you see it coming down and it went about that far before they had the airstream broke it up. Okay, ballast. Okay, the next thing is um, I got here is oh I have the can the canopy's gonna shrink on you. If it's a champ hearth uh, duo discus or an arcus or something, it's gonna shrink a lot, like when it gets cold. So you might want to take, that's something you have to worry about in the summertime, but in the wintertime you want, might want to put a, a better seal system in there of some kind. I've done that. You can't just put a bunch of foam in there because then it, when it gets warm you can't close it. So what you have to do is, or one thing, one way you can do is just go to the hardware store and get a quarter inch chisel, take, put a torch on it, bend it 90 degrees, and then rake a groove all the way around there about, you know, a sixteenth deep, and then put your foam tape in that. That way the canopy will still shut. Um, Okay, strength. Now, I'm not going to abdicate flying, uh, doing any certain thing with with the speed you fly. I'll just tell you what my philosophy is, and that is that the 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 more percentage of the weight, the mass of the glider that's in the wings, spread out in the wings, as a ratio compared to the fuselage, the safer it gets, as the higher the, the wing loading is compared. So the worst situation would be a two seat Nimbus. 3D, say, or an AS, ASH-25 with a self-launch motor in it, two <coughs> people in it, and no water ballast. If I were flying that on the ridge, I don't think I'd go into the yellow line very far at all. But if you're flying a 50-meter glider, especially, a, say, an 18-meter glider, a 50-meter span, um, and you're full of water, uh, that, that's pretty much an indestructible airplane. And, and I don't have any problem, you know, flying up in here with it. It's just not going to break. You're going to take a beating, but you're not going to break the airplane. That's my opinion. <clears throat> um, security uh, straps. Make sure, of course, when you're flying, it's different than when you're flying thermals. When you're flying the ridge, you're going to take, take some bumps. If you're flying the ridge the way I did. Like you're, you're pulling five, five and a half positive all day as long as, at least that's what the recording G meter said when I got home every night. Also, it's five and a half positive, three and a half negative. So you're getting thrashed around that cockpit. And mo most of these gliders have okay straps for a crash, but they're not good for going straight up and down. So you want to put a crotch strap in there if you don't have one. And all, this is the seat pan here. Just cut a little groove in the in the seat pan right behind the stick. This is a stick here, and then uh, put this fiberglass in a little rod across there, and then put the belt around that. And you get these straps from Wings and Wheels or whatever a, a fit strap for your for your um, airplane. I recommend it highly. You really shouldn't fly on without one. <coughs> <laughs> right. Another important thing, so you don't have to come back and land early. Um, uh, there's, you know, different approaches to this system. And, and when you're young, you just hold it, right? Well, then um, that that doesn't work for you. So you go on to then you switch to. I think the evolution in the second ten years is bags, 
and you get tired of doing them and they spill and everything else. So you finally end up with doing a serious overboard piece system in your glider. The, uh, the catheter goes here. This is a quick disconnect you can get. I, I don't know if it's a medical device or whatever it is, but there, when you click this together, um, that there's a valve in here which, which uh, opens up. So when that's off, it's shut, so you don't make a mess in the cockpit when you get out, when you take this thing apart. And, but you have to make sure this contraption is all the way in there and that there's a little uh, chrome, you can't see it, a little chrome snap here that you unlock it with. Right there it is. You've got to make sure that's always snaps in because this valve doesn't open up until that's all the way in there. That's how I found out. <laughs> 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 and then, and then it goes, uh, assuming you're going to, uh, uh, you have an onboard, so this goes, then it goes down to the seat panel, which is right here, and then it goes into solid tubing polyethylene, you go to Home Depot or something, get some quarter inch polyethylene tubing and plumb it down into your seat pan. It's got to be rigid tubing. Don't put this silicone in there because when you sit in there, it'll smash that flat. And uh, because it's probably going to be there's tight, tight uh, tolerances down there under your seat pan. So run that out. Don't, don't do it the easy way and just tee it into the fuselage <clears throat> and bore a hole in the bottom of the fuselage. You don't want that urine running back on the bottom of the fuselage and getting in your rudder cables, rudder. That stuff is really corrosive. Think water's bad. Try, try urine. It's, it's bad news on metal, so don't do that. Uh, I, what I do is put it on. I just run back, put it on a landing gear door, back on the, on the lower corner of a landing gear door, and then when I take a leak, I just put the gear down and then put it back up again. But then after you, after you use it, you want to blow it out because guess what happens to urine if you get below 32 degrees? It's not good news. Because then the second next time you go to pay, guess what? So, and, and this this is just a. Shit, uh, shit. Close it off so when you want to blow it up, you open that up and blow it out. Also, it makes a mess in your trailer if you don't blow it out anyhow. So I do it after I land and blow it out again. Any questions on those systems? Yeah. Carl, I think I think it was you that had something in Soaring Magazine that was on the subject talking about if you're going to make a, maybe a rough off field landing, it's better with an empty bladder as opposed yeah. to having a burst bladder. Yeah, I meant Would to that say. You that put that in, in an article in Supreme, I think? Yeah, I did. I was at Hobbs in the contest way back. When the guy came in late in the day and made a finish, didn't quite make it to the airport, landed out in the sagebrush out there, did a hell of a ground whip in a PIK, and ended up in the hospital because it ruptured his bladder. And so that's a good reason not to fly around with a full bladder. So, I don't uh, somebody said that uh, um, Greg Leslie uses Depends. Does anybody ever use those things? I, I, I don't know if I could even let go and use the things. What do you think of a telephone? What do you think of them? They, they work okay. Do you feel wet? No. Uh -huh. No. There's, there's, there's no no muss, no fuss. You don't deal with this kind of contraption. They work great. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's great. You hear that? Your pens seem to work. I'll be wearing them pretty soon just without flying. So the, the position to fly in the ridge, as you probably know, it's, it's about even with the top. Here's John Good ripping down the ridge, even with the top, going as fast as he can, trying to beat me, but I'm above him, so I'm beating him up. I, I, probably have a, I think I have a flap ship, so that's what I'm doing. But anyway, and, and, a, and a reasonable distance out. I think if you're right into the trees, obviously you don't want to fly there because you're going to hit a tree sooner or later. But there's some frictional losses with the wind hitting the tree, so it's, it's probably a little bit stronger up a, a few feet anyway. So that's, that's probably the optimal place. But in flying with a lot of people, in identical performance airplanes, it does seem like the best place to fly is right about even with the top and pretty close to the trees. Um, so, um, I was going to say another reason to go ridge flying is not necessarily to set records or do anything. It's just a lot of fun compared to other soaring. When you're doing thermal soaring, you're up there and it's, it's you're up, you're up, you're up high, and you have to think where the hell is this next thermal going to come from and where am I going to land? All this stuff. When the ridge is going good. 
and you just fly along there. You don't have to worry about it. You're not going to land as least as you stay <laughs> in local. You can look at the sky, look at birds, you can sing a song and everything else. And, and it's exhilarating, I think. I still love ripping down that bridge with a tail back up in the air. And I did a lot of, and Mike Opitz and some of the other may have flown fighters at little level too. It's, it's damn similar to that in terms of your, your adrenaline level and the visual effect. When you're flying a low level of a fighter, you're not down there at 20 feet above the ground. I mean, you can do it, and we all did it for a while, but you can't stay down there very long because you're going to, it's too wearing, and you can't fly formation that low anyway. So you're always a little bit higher, and a, and a fighter probably flies about as much higher as it's going maybe, you know, 480 or whatever. If you're going into Route Pac 6 in Vietnam, you're probably doing 680 in your, in your, your thud. But for the most part, they're doing probably below 500. But it's, it's, it's very similar uh, visually because if you're in a glider, you're much lower, and the trees are flying by about as fast as the stuff flies by this guy when he's doing whatever for he was. When I did low levels, we didn't have all that uh, sophisticated stuff, so we had to, we had paper maps, and we'd plan this all out before the flight. And you had, uh, you had to get, it's really important to get the bombs on target on time. So you had to, you had to approach the target at the right speed and get in there. So we had, we did everything in term, in, um, in, uh, divided by 60s. 420 or 480 or something like that. So we could, if we could plan to fly the flight at 480, then you could back off a little bit to make the time just right. But I don't, it, Mike never had to fly. A, he also had that F-16, so he didn't have to worry about anything, right, Mike? Well, the A-7. I mean, oh, that's right, the A-7. Well, the A-7 had a, a paper map. Six miles a minute, you know, six miles a minute, seven yeah. miles a minute. Yeah, seven miles, miles a minute. minute. Yep. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, I was going to say, but when you, um, the transitions, I'm talking about transitions now, um, there's a lot of different transitions, just straight across the gap. This is the Bedford Gap mm -hmm. down near Bedford, PA, uh, and it's going north. So the two, the two ridges uh, ends are about the same altitude, but it's about eight miles across there. So you, you need some altitude, you can't just fly straight across it like you could at the, uh, the, the Altoona Gap is up in here, and that one you can just zip straight across coming south, but this one you can't, you have to get some altitude. And when you're approaching, if you have a day like this where you got some uh, moisture and you got uh, streets working, um, as you're approaching the end of the ridge where the gap, where you're going to have to stop and climb, don't necessarily go right to the end of the, of the, the ridge, or the gap, or the, the, where the ridge drops off. Go to the last street where you can usually tell where it is by a shadow down here, uh, what the street is, and get under that and you climb there, even if it's a mile or two back. So as you approach the end of the, before you get to this stage, say back of two or three miles, slow up and start tuning along there at you know, 60 or 70 at 500 feet high and sample the air. If it's blue and you get a bump, you know, a mile short, take that. Don't, don't go to the end because otherwise you'll you end up going back to it anyway. Okay? Um, <coughs> I was going to have, uh, um, if we got time to do this, sure. we have a little, we're, we're going to fly Google here for a second, if we can make this work. Sure. I wanted to show you um, <coughs> um, one ridge transition, uh, it's the, the, the infamous Milesburg Gap, and uh, I won't say his name, but uh, more than one uh, U.S. team pilot um, a ex fighter pilot whose father flew ME 163s. He's raising his hand, this long air, air to this, this gap. So Bobby Tuplin has landed uh, out there too, twice. Yeah, 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 I've landed there a couple times. But uh, the problem with the Milesburg gap is um, it's a staggered gap, and by that I mean you're going from a, a, a you're jumping across a little hole in, in the ridge there, and the place you depart is the downwind of the place you're, the, the part of the ridge you're going to, and you're turning into the wind a little bit, so that's another disadvantage, and uh, you know the, the place you're going to is higher, so you got that to worry about. And a lot of times, the wind. Um, are we looking north or south? Or We're looking south. southwest, okay. going across Milesburg. Milesburg, incidentally, is, if you don't know, it's, a, it's very close to the ridge soaring glider port. It's on Bald Eagle Ridge, you know, Belfont. Is it so, the a first area? major gap going southwest? Yeah, it is. So you're coming along here. This is, get down a little bit lower. This is this is much higher than this is here. You're departing. This is where, the, where you have to stop and get some altitude. 
maybe you might get it back here, but you have to be high going across here. This ridge you can see goes fairly steep, and all of a sudden it starts to, not suddenly, but it does kind of level off here. And that ridge, that, that wind's going to be going just like that, which is damn near horizontal. So you almost have to get in there this high. If you go across here, you don't have enough, you get a little bit ahead of when you get some sink coming off this, and all of a sudden you're down in here, and then you're not getting back up again. And you, where you are going to go is a field up there that costs you $75 to get out of. It's <laughs> 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 about three miles from the glider port because you can't make it to the glider port. So fly across there. <clears throat> yeah, so you're going to end up, hopefully, yeah. You want to see a little lower? No, that's good. Yeah, just great. So that's about what it looks like a lot of time when you're doing it right. And if you're and going, you'll you're get right in here, and then you're going to be pretty good. If you're down in here, you're in trouble. Now going the other way is absolutely the opposite. You don't even just close your eyes and eat your lunch. You're just you're not going to have any problems at all. It's downwind, downhill, everything. It's easy as pie. Okay, now um, let's do another transition. You might have to do at some point is when you're just downwind of a ridge. There's no gap. You're going to go straight into the wind. You're going from uh, let's see, you came down Mahan Tango, so over, and you got over in, into north of uh, Harrisburg there, and you want to get over to Tuscarora from the back side. And, and uh, okay, so we'll do that. Well, we have the right gap. Well, if you're in Tuscarora, you're going to be coming from. Yeah. Just go over, go over to the left there and get, get downwind to Tuscarora. That's exactly where we are. <clears throat> okay. All right, so now you've gotten up somewhere, down, you're down at Harrisburg or somewhere, you decide to get over Tuscarora Ridge from the back side, you're, the, you're going to go over the downwind side of it. This is Tuscarora here. Yep, right there. All right, so get around at right angles to it. Or get over, get over here. That's shade, sorry. What? Was that shade? Nope, that was shade. Sorry about that. That's yeah. Tuscarora. Oh, okay. Yeah, get over here so you're far over to the left. I don't want to go from here. I want to get over here and like we're in flat land, yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, what you do, say, you, say you, that's as high as you can get in the lift, and you're saying, I don't know if I can get over Tuscarora or not, boy, I'm going to hit downdraft on the back side, what do I do? But you don't have luck, so you can you know, give it a try, because you got fields down here, you can get into a field if you, if you need to. So you start out over here, and before you get, you know, say when you're five or six miles out, look at a spot beyond in the valley. See that little white dot there? Mm -hmm. Okay, now as you progress along, that dot's going to go higher or lower, depending on whether you're getting better or worse. <laughs> and you cannot eyeball that ridge. If you try to eyeball the top of the ridge, you can't see anything. See how that got higher? So we're going to make that one. I'll go back and make it like we don't make it. <laughs> okay, now, now watch, watch what happens to that white dot when we don't make it. See that? It disappears. Oh, yeah. But you can't, you cannot eyeball the top of this ridge. You won't be able to do it. You're coming down at 25 or 20 to 1. You can't eyeball that, okay? All right. Those are the two transitions I want to talk about. Um, slideshow. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, if you're, one of the hazards you, you're going to get into at some point maybe is when you're flying along and the, the wind quits. You know how it does not soaring all the time, right? But <laughs> <laughs> it can quit or it can get weak or it can, you, the ridge can turn or the ridge can, you, the ridge shape isn't right, something's wrong, or you can get a wave wave pounding down on the ridge where it's supposed to be going up. So the, there's a lot of reasons the ridge can quit. And then this can happen. So a lot of, sometimes you'll be going across a gap and you end up across the gap where the Smilesburg or someplace else and you end up a little bit low and say, boy, I just slow up a little bit. So you pull back in the stick and, and a lot of times it works. Most of the time it works. You can stall your way back up to the top of the ridge, but real careful when you're doing that. I mean, fly the, that yaw string in the middle and, 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 uh, and just be ready, you know, have a field picked out and don't go across a ridge where you're uh, a gap where you're, you're going to have to be, end up in that real low speed situation where you don't have uh, anything planned for the far side of the field to land in. So you don't have to do this and get your glider out of the trees. I don't think I'd want to be this guy standing here with this guy with a chainsaw working over here, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Um, another indication of, uh, or another, not indication, that's a good direction of wind. But, um, another hazard to flying is these red-tailed hawks hover up there looking for a mouse. And when they do that, his eyeball is right there. And you can see you coming at him from behind. 
but his brain can't. That, that, bird, <laughs> that bird is looking, he's got target fixation. He's looking down there for a squirrel, and they don't see it to the last minute. Most birds do see it, and then red tails see it too, coming to, unless they're looking for a meal. And then if you fly under that bird, at some point they'll see you, and usually just when you're about 50 feet away, and of course they die for speed like all fighter pilots do, and that means it's into your canopy or something. So don't, don't fly under hovering red tails. That's the only bird I've ever seen hover. I mean, maybe a golden eagle once in a while, but all the rest of them just get out of your way. And they're pretty good about it. But a red tail uh, is not looking at you, not trying to challenge you or anything. Um, the birds vary in whether they'll get out of your way easily or not. A black vulture is, likes to fly with gliders. You see black vultures here all the time. Turkey vultures have, no, have nothing to do with gliders. They just scatter. <laughs> and that's why people blame them for not being able to thermal bird. They just don't like gliders. So if they have, have good thermal, they're going to leave and go to a weaker part. They don't care. So <laughs> eagles, eagles will fly. They, they, they think they're you know, boss of the air. They have been for a million years. Nothing challenged them. So they don't seem to mind gliders too much. You can get pretty close to an eagle. Well, that's well, it. I got, been, uh, anybody got questions about uh, the, the cover? Did you ever have an aggressive golden eagle come after you a little bit? What? An aggressive eagle? Uh, have I had an aggressive eagle? Uh, no. Have you? I had, yeah. I was at over at the reservoir one day. Oh, a bald eagle or a golden eagle? A golden eagle. Oh. And I just I wanted to see him better, so I turned toward him, and he turned toward me. You will get aggressive eagles out west, the golden eagles that nest out there. They'll, they'll the protect their, they'll die that you. I had that happen. I don't think they make contact most of the time. But mostly around here, you know, uh, they don't protect. Uh, there was no gold eagles nesting here. There's a lot of more and more bald eagles, so maybe we'll have some trouble with them. I don't know. It was only one time, but he, he definitely looked like he was. Hey, I'm, he's like a challenge. I didn't want to do it. I hit a gold eagle. Yeah. I climbed a little once. It did, luckily, it didn't kill him. I was just flying down the ridge. They fly about. They cruise about 45. They can, you know, they can go 90 if they want to. But the, mostly when they're going by, they're going 45 or 50. So that's about stall speed for a glider, but I got around behind him and I, and I went past him. And so I saw a shell going up here, so I back, back around and I kept him in sight. And I came up real spoilers. I, worked, well, I was watching him, he was kind of coming back this way. And all of a sudden he went, <laughs> I hit him right with a damn wing. Oh. And I said, oh shit. So I walked, but he tumbled and he recovered and flew. So he's okay. When I got on the ground, there's a great big puff of dust all over the wing. I shook all the puff of yeah. Uh, we have uh, Bob Cook here. He actually had a bird strike. I don't know if you wanted to tell us a little bit about it. Were you underneath him when he came to I the never county? saw the bird before. I was flying our southeast ridge, and I had just dived down. For, I was doing like 45 miles an hour, and I dived down to 90, leveled out, and then pow, came through the canopy, hit me in the head. Oh, what was it? I'm pretty sure it was a red tail. But I don't know how he got from where he was. I didn't see him in front of me. He came this way. Yeah. So, uh, well, he's trying to dive to get out of your way. I mean, they, you think they'd know better, but they, 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 a bird's going slow like that. A hovering red tail's probably doing, what, 20 or something. I think it's like stall speed's 20 or 25, and they're hovering there. And then they want, they want, they want 70 or 80 from the new village, so they're going to dive, even though you're below them. That's what happens. I think what was interesting about this story is the bird knocked his glasses off, he kept his cool, he fiddled around, found one lens, held it up to his eye, and landed. <laughs> 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 but keep your head when yeah, everything yeah. wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Something cut my head and it was kind of bloody. And the dirt from the floor all went in my eyes too. It wasn't good for a few minutes there. Yeah. 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 The, um, Bridge you fly along, you know, is Hawk Mountains down there where they wash them. They also trap birds up there um, for falconry and for banding and whatnot. And the president of the of the state falconry club um, was trapping up there last year, up there in Lee Heightens, where they had the one trapping site. And he was by himself. He walked all the way in there with his trap and his blind and everything. Maybe the blind's in there. I guess there's a bunch of rocks and stuff. And uh, set up. And he saw a bird down there, and he's making the pigeon work, and the bird comes a helen into the trap, and, he, and just about two seconds later, another one came in there, and he, he sprung the trap and got them both. He got two golden eagles in under one. We rarely, we trapped one golden eagle by every five years where I do it. But he got two of them in the trap at the same time. He's up there by himself. 
And not only that, he managed to extract two golden eagles out of that trap and get a selfie with it. I'll send it to you. <laughs> 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 oh, I guess he's too <laughs> Yeah, that's Ripley's belief. Right now. <laughs> uh, so, any other questions? Thanks.